love to uh, introduce our next presenters, um, John Chuang and Elaine Seddenberg. Um, John is the uh, professor, uh, professor at the School of Information here at UC Berkeley, um, and he directs the Biosense Lab. Um, Elaine is a PhD candidate um, here at the School of Information and um, a co-director of the Center for Technology, Society, and Policy. Um, in keeping with great titles, uh, this one, Ubiquitous biosensing. John and Elaine, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, my mic sounds OK? You can all hear me? OK, great. Um, so I'm going to kick off uh, before John to get us all in the mood to talk about biosensing. Um, quick talk roadmap. First, I'm going to get us all on the same page about what are we talking about when we talk about biosignals. We take a fairly promiscuous view of what we consider to be a biosignal, and we're going to walk through that. Then John is going to introduce some applications of EEG authentication, um, as well as um, some studies that we've done in our lab about social sharing of biosignals and how that impacts how people use technology. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some of the social and policy challenges we face because of the nature of these signals. So first off, a little bit about me. You just heard a little bit. So um, unfortunately, I don't have any great photos of me in uh, biosensing technology. So I went ahead and added some in here uh, just real fast to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but I think, uh, so John directs the Biosense Lab, and I'm a PhD candidate. At, John's one of my advisors. And um, we work on, and our lab works on a lot of different aspects about biosensing technology. Everything from, again, these social and policy aspects to more of the technical how to actually create applications that use biosignals or improve the way we collect them. So first, let's start off with what do we consider to be biosignals? Um, we typically include, and this is not an exhaustive list, but um, heart rate and breathing um, data, your body temperature, uh, fingerprints, or other traditional biometrics, which are going to be used where they might have a unique spacing that's unique to you. Biosensing does not always equal biometric. Um, oftentimes, I see them confused uh, with each other. We have EEG data, which is electroencephalography. Um, electrodermal activity, EDA, which it, you may know as galvanic skin response. Iris scans, pupil dilation, eye tracking, a lot of these things. You know, we also have retinal scanning. Um, we think these are going to be more and more important as we start placing VR headsets on our head, and we might have cameras watching where we go. Um, some of those have a technical application, right? Um, they can mimic the eye in that when you move your eye around, you're not focused, not everything is in focus. So you could reduce computing power with that, but that also tells you a lot about where our attention is and also a lot about what our brain is doing. Um, and then also we consider facial recognition and emotional AI, um, are obviously artificial intelligence. I can't imagine anybody in this audience not knowing what that is. Um, and so I think uh, with that, um, this idea that also like our physiological responses also correspond to our emotions a lot. And so that's something that you can pick up just from visual feeds um, and even fairly low visual feeds. So the ones that just highlighted in blue, um, these are, oops, I'll just give away the rest of my talk. Um, <laughs> so um, these are the ones that can be sensed remotely. Um, so not everything, even your, they can do palm scans with you passing just a couple inches over. There's a company in France um, and be able to scan your entire um, palm, especially your fingerprints. Um, body temperature, a lot of things can be sensed within a few feet of each other. You don't actually have to make contact or put something on your skin in order for it to be captured, which is something that we think is also important. Now, when John talks about EEG data, he's also going to... Um, you know, talk about like it may not be a very cumbersome setup that you need to um, put on. So it's going to be more and more facile to get these sensors on you to make sure to get these readings, um, which I think is going to complicate a lot of the social and policy aspects, just to give away the end there. We, John and I and the rest of the Biosense Lab group believe that this is an emerging class of data because it's not quite health information. It could be health information, but it's not always considered to be like that. And we also think it's a little bit different uh, for these particular characteristics than, say, um, you know, your web browsing traffic or your geolocation or other things. And the reasons are, is it's expansive in scope, right? I gave you kind of a quick and dirty list of what we consider to be biosignals. Um, but other people could argue that other things are biosignals or, bio or that emotional data is or isn't. 
Um, there's just many different types. And also kinesthetic, I didn't include a lot of that, but that gives a lot of way about what's going on with our body, with how we move. Um, they're very intimate, it's very intimate data, except it's also leakable. I'm, I'm emitting biosignals right now to all of you, and I have no idea what sensors you're equipped with, or, and you also, you know, I mean, very interesting, you can send me my biosignals after this talk. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that they're inherently public, but they're kind of fuzzy to us, which gets me to the next one, is they're precise, yet they're ambiguous. We can tell you your biosignals with a long string of significant digits, um, especially on medical grade devices, but what does that actually mean? Or what does that mean for my body versus your body? Um, and so that's something that we're trying to figure out. They're also familiar yet unverifiable. So this idea that um, I, I feel like I know my heart rate, I feel like I know different things about my body and that it doesn't seem like a crazy thing, but if you were to show me John's heart rate right now and my heart rate and say, I took these while you were giving the talk, please tell me which one was you, I probably wouldn't know. I know that my heart rate is racing just a little bit, but I wouldn't be able to verify that yes, that was in fact me. Um, they also have limited controllability. Again, like they're very leakable, they're everywhere, and short of stopping breathing, I can't stop a lot of these biosignals because that's the essence in which we live. So with that, I'm going to hand over to John to talk about some specific aspects. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, it gives me great pleasure to actually follow my own PhD student. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around. The professor gives the big picture talk and then the PhD student comes in and talks about the details. Um, this is a very, very unusual partnership area. Uh, I just look at my heart rate, it's 114, right? <laughs> so, so you get to interpret what 114 means, except probably only couple of people in this room know what my normal heart rate is <laughs> and put some context to it. Um, I want to start with uh, brainwave signals, EEG, because um, you know, when we talk about ubiquitous biosensing, you may think about Fitbit, number of steps, heart rate, and yes, they're already very ubiquitous. But I think one of the message takeaway that I hope you, you take away with uh, today is that even your brainwave signals, some, even things associated with what you're thinking about, your mental, emotional states, are things that uh, there are technologies available today that's going to make it very ubiquitous for all of us to be collecting this class of signals. What you see here are a collection of photographs of neural sensing in the lab. So this is what neuroscientists employ when they collect data from their subjects to publish scientific research. Um, you know, they, they are not something that you will wear to go to a party, or in some cases, you have to lie down and stick your head into some, machi some machine for you to, to have your uh, uh, brainwave data be read. The arrow. But this is where we are already today. This is not where we are going. This is where, uh, as of the last couple of years, a, a, a whole range of different consumer-grade devices that are available for a few hundred dollars a piece that you can purchase that can capture EEG signal. Yes, it is true that they lack the signal quality uh, of the uh, research-grade devices, but, but nonetheless, with uh, machine learning advances. There is a, a lot of advancement with regards to what you can get with quantity that can more than compensate for quality. So it leads to uh, you know, product brochure pictures like this, that in fact, not only will you look silly, you will in fact look very cool with a <laughs> cup of coffee <laughs> while you are transmitting your brain waves uh, to your friends. So um, the first, one of the first projects that we at Biosense Lab did was to investigate whether it's possible for us to use this technology, the consumer version of the technology, for performing user authentication. This is a task that all of us are very familiar with. We perform this multiple times throughout a day, and um, we all struggle with our relationship with passwords, right? And so the question is, can we move from passwords to pass thoughts? This concept was uh, originally proposed uh, about 12 years ago, and since then there has been a number of studies 
uh, employing research grade devices, demonstrating that yes, it actually works. So uh, uh, in 2007, achieving 92% accuracy, and uh, the 2008-2011 studies, where the, the number of subjects is five in each case, they were able to achieve 100% accuracy in authenticating a person based purely on their brainwave signals. So what we did is to say, well, number one, let's take a single channel consumer grade device. Number two, uh, that has in fact allowed the participants to choose their own secret thought. So to make it analogous to you choosing your own password. So different from just putting your fingerprint on the sensor. And number three, uh, just interrogating to what extent users will find this technology usable, something that they would use. Okay. Um, so we, we brought in a pool of subjects. Um, we have them put on this device over there. We recorded their signals while they performed a variety of different mental tests. And then importantly, we have them come back on a different day more than a week later and repeated the same process to see how those signals may or may not change over time. Uh, the tests uh, were come, come in a variety of ranges. Um, in some cases, well, we start with a baseline that is uh, very common, just close your eyes and breathe. To some motor imagery tests, you imagine moving some part of your body without actually moving those muscles. To some associated with auditory, right, imagining singing a song, um, or some involving uh, external stimulus, an audio or color task. And finally, one last one, you are free to choose whatever thought it is that you want to think. Could be your cat, could be your grandmother, it could be anything at all, right? As you can see, some of these tests allow you to choose a personal secret uh, that uh, you can employ. Uh, here's some data, but the bottom line is that uh, by employing some uh, threshold-based protocol, we are able to get the uh, error rate down to, in, in the bottom right-hand corner, 1.1%, right? So basically, um, for both cases where it is a legitimate user who's trying to log in, as well as if it's an attacker who's trying to impersonate as you, we look at both the false acceptance rate and the false rejection rates, and both numbers can be driven down to uh, very low levels. In a follow-up questionnaire, we asked the subjects, you know, so out of these different tests, which ones did you find difficult or easy to perform? Which one did you find enjoyable or boring to perform? And then finally, if you were to choose one that you repeat on a regular basis as your past thought, which out of these seven would you choose? So what you see is that in this user responses that it is a combination of two factors, both that the task is not too difficult to perform, um, and at the same time, it is not boring to perform. That combination will produce the past thought that people will find most easy and enjoyable to repeat. Uh, these past, past thoughts are also very easy to remember. So a standard performance metric is recall rate. We asked them a week later, tell us what did you choose for your four chosen secrets? And you see that with one exception, everybody was able to recall what their past thought was. Uh, in a follow-up study, we considered an a impersonation attack. Right? So, so there are, again, a lot of numbers. The key takeaway is that uh, even if you go to the, all the way to the right column, <laughs> and the bottom number. So this is where we give the attacker the correct secret. You know, this is a person you're trying to impersonate. Here's their task, and here is their secret, right? Uh, the false ac acceptance rate, basically the possible probability that an attacker can successfully attack the system given the correct secret is 5%, right? Think about, compare this against password, right? If I told you my password is, <laughs> right? It, um, and assuming that I told you the truth, uh, you should be able to get in close to 100%, right? So, so in this case, even if I told you, and I in fact have my past thought published on, on uh, one of the news articles out there, <laughs> you can go fi find out what it is, um, you still only have a 5% success rate. 
so um, I've been pushing this idea of one step, two fa factor authentication. So many of you, I'm sure, uh, are users of two factor authentication. You know, all these big companies strongly encourages us to, uh, to turn on two factor authentication. But many of us uh, refrain from doing so. Why? Because of the hassle, right? It's too much work, right? Um, traditional two factor authentication requires two steps. When you go to an ATM machine, to withdraw cash, you put up with the hassle of putting in a card and then typing in a pin. Those are two separate steps, right? You know, if you have an iPhone, you know that the technology for your phone to support two-factor authentication is already there, right? You can either enter the pin or you can supply a biometric. But actually, Apple asks you to choose one or the other. It doesn't force you to do both, right? Because it knows that it's a big turn off for everybody. So um, the, the, the prospect uh, that we are pushing for is that with past thoughts and maybe other similar types of technologies that employ, employ different types of biosensors, we may be able to achieve what we call one-step, two-factor authentication. Another direction that our lab is pushing towards is uh, what we call discrete neural sensing. Right? So, so one of the common questions that we get is that, okay, this is very cool, it works, but I look silly wearing something on my head, right? Uh, there are many different, um, th different uh, researchers out there who are pursuing different ways in which you can overcome, overcome this. So Sony, for example, uh, found a patent of a smart wig. So, so if you have to wear a wig, then you can have these electrodes underneath that will not be visible. Um, uh, uh, some engineers here at Berkeley are working, have been working on neural dust. Um, uh, in fact, one of the PhD students who graduated from that project is now a key personnel at Neuralink. Neuralink, if you recall, is the new startup by Elon Musk. Um, so this is a technology that requires some invasive procedures uh, to, to implant some electrodes uh, under your skull. Um, at the bottom, you see different pictures related to year-based EEG. It turns out that the, the year, both around the year as well as within the year and the year canal, are excellent locations for you to deploy electrodes for capturing brainwave signals. Um, so in fact, um, in our lab, we've actually built something like that too. Um, so as you can see, rather than something that is um, big and bulky, you could actually just put this in like a earbud, and it looks like you're just listening to music. Uh, forget about this wires. Um, <laughs> like, I guess at some point, we will be able to uh, make wireless versions of this. So we actually collect, we have actually already collected data and have some, some very good results coming out of what you can achieve with these more discrete looking devices. Um, the, uh, one of the things that we um, are able to, to demonstrate is that um, uh, not only are these signals useful for authenticating users, we can also use them for doing mental gesture recognition. So in a sense, this is an, 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 you may have heard about brain-computer interfaces, BCIs. Um, what, what we expect to see uh, in a near, very near future is um, in fact, we are already seeing a lot of different developments from both industry and academia on uh, mental gesture recognition. Facebook being the latest new entrant into this field. Um, I'm running out of time, so what I want to do is to very quickly switch gears and just give you a, a sneak uh, preview of another work that has recently come out of uh, Biosense Lab. It is not as exotic as brainwave signals. It, we return to our humble heart rate. Um, and also, instead of thinking about how machines uh, interpret our signals, uh, it's also important for us to remember that human beings, the people around us, also interpret our biosignals. So here's a study by uh, our colleagues Nick and Coy. Um, which won a, uh, a best paper award uh, at a conference uh, a few months ago, looking at how you know, when, when two uh, people 
share real-time heart rate signals with each other, how might it affect their trust and cooperation between themselves, right? You see a picture here of the Apple Watch. You can, some of you may have already been doing it, sharing, sharing your heart rate signals, right? What if you are put into a situation, a dyadic di relationship, and they have to make decisions about how much am I going to trust and cooperate with the other person? Um, so if you're interested, go to our web page, uh, check out this paper. Lots of very interesting results. I'm gonna, you, you get a flash through <laughs> of what they have done. Um, <laughs> but I'm out of time, so I'm going to turn it back over to Elaine. We're going till 10 after? We are going to 10 after. Okay, That's right. great. All right, so now we get to have a little bit of fun in terms of <laughs> Uh, just thinking through some many use cases, because I want to have all of you in the audience start thinking very imaginatively, imaginatively about how could these be used, in, how can this technology be used in different applications, and in many cases, like with heart rate, we're starting to see it's already getting built into, um, you know, I've got dumb everything, but, um, but it's already starting to get built into existing technology, and the way we'll socially interpret it will change, and the way our laws and policies will also start to evolve. So let's start with, I don't know who in here is a cybersecurity uh, specialist, but uh, Swift on Security, a very famous uh, parody Twitter, Twitter account, but also not so much of a parody and a very good commentator. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of new security paradigms, right? So um, maybe a fingerprint um, can be coerced, and this actually ties into Fourth Amendment law in the United States. Um, and different laws of you don't have to, um, they can actually just take your thumbprint and unlock your phone. Um, so we're having lags in other areas of law and policy. But, um, you know, EEG data, you can't quite do that. Uh, they can't make you, as of right now, make you think you're past thought. So um, anyway, also some interesting stuff about what you would do under pressure if even if they said, we're holding a gun to your head, unlock this device, whether it would actually change your signal. Um, there's also social surprises. So for those of you, I hope this is big enough to read. Yeah, uh, so uh, Superman and um, Lois Lane doesn't know it's Clark Kent, and then Facebook says, do you want to tag your coworker Clark Kent in this photo? Uh, facial recognition is going to do um, quite a lot. Uh, and so you know, be able to recognize you in different things. Some of the applications may be cool. Uh, some of them may be quite unexpected. Also dating, uh, looking at all Tinder users in this audience, um, you can imagine right now, um, it doesn't take very much. Someone could have an app on their phone, um, hold it up and say, hey, we're on this date. I want to know how into you, uh, how into me you are, how into yourself you are. I mean, that might be relevant. Um, and so, or starting to read your bio signals, like um, how into me are you? Are you healthy? Other types of screening mechanisms. Seems kind of weird, would definitely not want that on a date. Uh, but again, it would be a very easy application, right? You would just download this, and you would even be able to do it, and the other person wouldn't really even know that you were capturing those signals, right? It's invisible. Like, they don't even have to consent to do it. Um, it's not even that obvious you're doing it. Now thinking through advertising, right? So Mondelez International, they make a lot of different snack foods. They've been experimenting with smart shelves, or smart shelves. And these are purposefully kind of small because these are rough demos they put out like a year or so ago. But the idea would be is that in the supermarket aisle, you would walk up and it would be able to assess different things about you. Um, your age, they don't say weight, although I'm sure that they could approximate that too. Um, your gender, um, whether you're actually looking at the shelves, and then start to target ads. There's a little like screen there, and then they've got the food right there. Seems, for, seems like it would be probably a little bit annoying, um, but also think about the obesity epidemic and what this might mean when you're marketing different foods. Or there's different regulations around tobacco and alcohol, but um, you could also imagine scenarios um, maybe in other countries or even getting around it here where that's also marketed to people in a very aggressive, personalized way based on their interaction with something. But then also let's take this a step creepier, um, right? So political advertising, there's already been demos on this in other countries, slash we can kind of debate whether it was already done um, this year using other types of data. Um, but what I am the most concerned about is what's going to happen when they can hyper-target the severity of the ad or, you know, like the intensity of it based on your emotion, like, your um, registered emotional response. Disgust happens to be something that evolutionarily that we all uh, exhibit very uh, prominently on our faces because if you eat something and it's bad and you make a gross face, everybody else in the tribe needs to know that so they don't eat the same thing. 
So if you see an ad and you get a look of disgust, they know to change it right away. But if you don't get a look of disgust, they can start you know, um, boiling the frog and making it worse and worse. Um, and this is something that would be completely unregulated and could happen in the real world, not just online, but the fact that you can walk by a billboard and without you knowing, it could read your facial expressions and start changing, or even other biosignals that you might be emitting. Another thing I think about is what would happen if you are in international negotiations, right? Um, someone is sitting down and you then know the other person is lying. And you know that you are, you are trying to make an agreement and you can tell that you think based on the app on your phone that that person's lying. How are we going to deal with that? Are we going to make sure that negotiations happen where people have to leave their phones outside like they have to do in uh, different security settings? I think that these are things we haven't quite thought through and might even come out and the other kind of thing is, is what is the technology going to, you know, what's the integrity of that technology? What happens if it's wrong and you think you're trying to make a, an arms agreement and it says the other person's lying and they're not? Um, so those are the types of things that I think about in terms of, and I think it's very near future how this technology could be used like that. So I think it's important to think about, so where do we go from here, right? I, I, personally, for me, that all sounds a little bit creepy. Um, and a little bit of unsure, and it seems like a little bit of a wild west um, in terms of how this technology would get deployed. So what are we going to do about it? That's kind of my job. But also a hard question to uh, <laughs> answer. I think we can take a lot of lessons from how um, when, when cameras, um, so when Kodak released the Eastman camera, and it was something that it was portable, you didn't have to be a trained photographer to use it. Um, there was a lot of pushback from society in terms of suddenly, um, there, there was a lot of, from the history accounts I've read, um, that people were concerned that you would uh, catch a, a glance, or you would permanently catch a glance on somebody's face of an unsavory emotional facial you know, response. Well, it sounds a lot like some of the concerns I have with biosensing technology. Um, you also had a lot of people concerned about you would now taking this technology into new places. So it could suddenly be in your parlor, and um, that was something where previously you wouldn't have had that set up, and it was also a smaller camera. Um, since we had a lot of privacy laws that cropped up, some, as you know, you can take pictures in public pretty much anywhere. But one of the biggest differences I see between biosensing technology and cameras is cameras rely on being within eyesight of somebody, right? So if I took my camera out and even discreetly did something with my iPhone, you all would know something weird was up, right? I'm like holding my phone in weird places. Um, but at the same time, like I could have something reading people's biosignals that could go through walls and you would have no idea that that technology was there. Even surveillance cameras seem to have to be, you know, within eyesight in order to uh, capture you and you can kind of look around and be aware of your environment. But there are specific state laws that came up around use of particular um, uh, cases where cell phone cameras um, were used in inappropriate locations and they actually created laws that would make it so you could criminalize that activity. Um, so I think that we're going to have to kind of look at the laws like that because most of these biosensing technology, most of these biosensing data, when they're outside of the healthcare context, may relay a lot of the same information, but aren't going to be considered health information. So they won't be restricted by those privacy laws. I think the other thing that I, you know, when I think about these range of emotions and things that we exhibit, is they're they're all public, right? Everything we do. Um, I can't restrict this. I don't necessarily want to restrict this. Aside from there are some cases where you can have a reflective scarf that if someone takes a flash photo of you at night, it can light up your face and make it impossible. It's sort of anti-paparazzi um, technology. Um, and so, you know, and there's other things like um, using some odd makeup or something else. But I think it's going to be a challenge because we emit these all the time. And we are also not very sure what they mean. So it's going to be a challenge to regulate. Um, even looking at very restrictive privacy models in, say, the EU, um, they restrict the collection of biometric data, and they specifically say it must be tied to your identity. Well, what about you don't need to know who I am to start telling attributes about me or to hyper-target and add to me. I don't need to know who you are as a group of people in order to know that the, the mood in this room is starting to get low and you need happy hour, right? Or um, get a, you know, a mob of protesters or something and to start making deductions about what you think they're up to. I don't need to know their identity. So we're going to have to be very critical about the laws as, we, as they start to evolve. Because not all these applications are bad, right? But there are these other ways that it could be used in that ick creepy factor that we're going to need to think about. 
So then I'm going to open it up to questions. I just like this photo. It's a little dark, uh, and I did that on purpose. Uh, I took this photo on BART on election night, and the looks on people's faces are a nice range. Uh, and I always uh, wish I could have like uh, emotional AI at that point to uh, tell how people are feeling. Great news is, is I can eventually run emotional AI on this photograph, even though it was taken historically. Another creepy aspect of some of the biosensing. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to open this up to questions. I'm also going to uh, place up some of our information. You can check out our forthcoming paper um, over the summer. It's going to be published in a uh, book on privacy in public. And so we have a section on biosensing. Right now, the draft version is up on Archive, the um, public repository. Um, you can get to it from our website, Biosense at Berkeley, or of course you can email John or myself. All right, back to questions. Elaine Jones, thank you very much. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Um, let's take a question at the back there, sir, and then we'll come down the front and then there, yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned, no, oh. <laughs> uh, Okay, yeah, you mentioned, uh, Policies that can evolve to uh, mitigate some of the some of these issues, but do we even need policies to mitigate a lot of these? So, for instance, if you have a supermarket that's overstepping their bounds with their ads, yep. and the public perceives this as creepy, people won't go there. And so, there you know the public's rejection of these of these things can sometimes be enough. I think that's a great point and something I didn't mention. I think social norms are going to be uh, really important, and that's something you see with the introduction of cameras, too. So there are certain places where people go, please don't take photos here, or you know, like, or it's like you're being really weird right now, and you need to do that. And there's this social pressure, right, that that's inappropriate in certain contexts. I also think, um, you are right, you can avoid certain places. Um, and it can also be something where just, you know, I have certain friends that don't like their photos taken. I know they don't, therefore I don't use the technology. It doesn't mean that there is a law in place. And I think that is going to be important because in many ways I don't want to see laws that restrict all of these technologies. There's a lot of really good things that we can do. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, we are going to have to think to make sure that malicious actors don't have a leg up. There was another question at the back. Yeah, if you just um, move the microphone along there. Thank you. Um, I kind of have a two-part, but one question. Um, <laughs> um, have you guys done the testing for like the past thought on different emotional states? So like, is it different if I'm like really stressed out and I've been anxious about something all day and then I'm trying to think about like my cat? Like, does that is that different? And then on top of that, um, do the brain waves and everything like change over time. So like five years down the line, is it gonna be different when I think about something and is that gonna prevent me from being able to get in? Both excellent questions. Um, the questions that we have uh, been investigating. Uh, it, we, we, we have, um, in the study I mentioned, uh, we had data between two weeks and uh, the temporal stationarity between two weeks is very high. We have since then collected data over the period of one year, and so we are actually in the process of analyzing um, uh, to, to see uh, to what extent your data from a year later uh, can still be used uh, to go authenticate based on your data on day one. Or if not, how often you will then need to recalibrate or refresh your, your template to keep up. So, so that's a great question. Uh, with regards to uh, different physiological, psychological states that you may be in, how that may affect your ability to authenticate, that's also something that we have looked at. Um, in particular, we found that uh, exercise, right? If you just went for a run or you're running late to a meeting and you're trying to log in, um, that, that doesn't work. So because of, and we, we see that basically your authentication accuracy drops hmm very significantly, but it recovers in the next 45 to 90 seconds. So if you're out of breath running to a meeting, this is not going to work, but you know, soon thereafter, once you've come down, actually it works. Uh, other, other factors, like whether you are stressed, whether you've just had alcohol, whether you've just had caffeine, these are all uh, open questions uh, subject to study. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one. Alan, down here, thank you. Wait for the mic then. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's also uh, following the line of the past thought, and is in particular the 
an allergy between that and the password. Sure. I think for password, I mean, throughout these years, you know, people say, you know, I'll make it more secure. So it has to be like the first one is the, uh, or just the lens itself is going to be making a difference on the security, how secure it is. So I, I don't know if like, you know, you're going to think of one thought. I mean, yeah. what's the unit of that? You know, I mean, I'm going to do recite the Pledge of Allegiance yeah. for the whole time or something like that. What, what is the normal? Uh, Excellent know. question, the, the duration. So we started with 10 second uh, trials. Mm -hmm. um, and we've since found that you can, in fact, reduce it to five seconds uh, without a significant uh, impact on performance. We've also investigated concatenating multiple. So if, if you think one thought followed by a, a second one, that doesn't improve uh, the accuracy any further. So, so there is some optimal sweet mm -hmm. spot with regards to how long your past thought needs to be. OK. Another one is like, uh, um, uh, have you, I mean, this is on the Im impersonating part. Mm -hmm. uh, would twins help for, you know, <laughs> I, I mean. Do they have similar question. ground waves? Yeah. Um, I, I personally have a, a set of twin girls, so oh. I'm personally very interested in this question. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, biologically, uh, if, even identical twins uh, have their cerebral cortex folded differently, even if they're genetically identical. And because EEG is highly modulated by the structure of our cortex, that the, the emitted EEG signal will be very different, even for tens. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I've got a, one right in the middle there. I will take that. Were you, were you at all influenced by the movie Blade Runner? <laughs> <laughs> there are too many movies that are all inspired by. Before being testing, for replicants. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, take we'll take movies. one there and then one at the back. Yes, miss. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, it's a good question. Um, at, at, at the surface level, we need to therefore uh, think about how to design the authentication handshake, right? That we don't want to be authenticating all day or, or be open to the possibility of authenticating all day long. But the flip side of it is that, in fact, there is a, a separate opportunity of what's called continuous authentication. That instead of us authenticating on demand, that, OK, I need to check my email now, what if we have, since we are wearing these devices already, that we remain authenticated on a continuous basis throughout the day, right? So that way, we could, in fact, get to a point where you don't even need to authenticate at all. So we go from one step to zero steps. Okay. Gentleman in the blue jacket there, yes. So when we are using these uh, non-touch technologies, what's stopping somebody else from stealing your appliance? I'm sorry, can, can you please elaborate on the question? Um, uh, Non-touch? Yeah. yeah, the remote sensing? Yeah, yeah um, okay. certainly a challenge, right? Um, so it could be anything from, uh, you know, the gov U.S. government employees have had all of their fingerprints, uh, you know, uh, were given away in the OMB hack. Um, and so it is part of the problem of only using biometrics, which is something that I think is slightly different for EEG data because it's something that you can change, it's something that you can... Uh, mutate versus I can never, without some serious pain, change my fingertips, right? And so, um, but that is, that's part of where it's so leakable, right? So anything that I do, um, the sensor that I'm thinking of in France, the idea is that it would let you into a building by just swiping your hand, and it would be able to tell it was you and let you in, right? But okay, that could be on this podium, and I could swipe my hand, and they would know me. Um, so I think that's where it needs to be built into the security, um, you know, uh, models of how you're going to employ that particular authentication. And John had mentioned using that as two-factor, which a lot of people don't do on their iPhones. Good time for maybe two more. Yes, there, and then we'll go to the back. Um, can we get a mic down here, please?
Thank you. So today there was an MIT technology review um, that was just released and it talked about this subject. And it was talking about the possibility that by tracking brain waves, it sounds actually like a machine learning problem, but by tracking brain waves and watching someone's activity and in in what they were doing was uh, talking about watching somebody's typing, mm -hmm. that they could actually start to guess a password. password. And, and what the title says is that they can pluck the password right out of your brain. It sounds like a bit of a stretch, but I would, wanted to ask if you had any comments about that or any thoughts about it. Um, yes. I, I'm. Uh, quite familiar with that line of research. They are, in fact, not the first. They are, in fact, the third uh, to, to have demonstrated this possibility of what's called, a, if you are a security uh, researcher, this is uh, a class of attack known as the site channel attack. To what extent you might, through an interface, learn something about an individual, their secret, in an un, uh, unintentional way. Um, this is, of course, not unique to BCI, to, to brain computer interfaces. This actually applies across many different modalities. Um, there are, uh, in each of these studies, there are some uh, significant caveats with regards to the extent that they are able to, to extract uh, private information. So that is one thing that I, uh, I, I should probably mention. Uh, in the context of all the different possible things we can learn uh, from your brain, authentication is, in my opinion, by far the simplest, right? Just simply answering a yes, no question. Are you who you claim to be? Uh, going from there to, you know, reading your mind, uh, retrieving your memory, uh, or even, you know, uh, inferring what your mental state is. Each one of those are in my opinion, orders of magnitude more difficult, more challenging than the simple uh, task, simple task of authentication. But that doesn't mean that none of those will be achievable uh, in the coming years. So, so now is a good time for us to recognize and start to contemplate what our responses might be when these become technical realities. Okay. Let's, we've got time for just one final question. There was a gentleman in the back row there. Yes, sir. Can you wait? Can you wait for the mic? Is one behind, just behind you there? Thanks. I'm just curious about what the mo underlying model is when you collect the data about. Okay, we've like gathered the the, the brain waves for a person when they're thinking their past thought. How do you then? What what model are you using to say? Okay, this is this is the right person, or this is not the right person. Yes. Uh, Thank you. We, we've tried several uh, approaches. In our first approach, we did a similarity comparison. So we took these brainwave signals as vectors, and we took cosine similarities, and we established some threshold above which we say that's a match, or below which it is not. Uh, we've also since tried uh, binary classification. Since we are, sim since we are just ask answering a yes-no question, uh, binary classif classifiers is also a very natural tool. Uh, in both cases, we get a very consistent and very high accuracy rates. Okay, great, thank you. Elaine, John, thanks so much for... Uh <laughs>